Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, for tuning in on our uh, Healthcare Sector Employers Panel. Uh, this event is co-organized uh, in partnership by SFU Alumni Relations, uh, the BD Career Management Center, Korean Volunteer Services, and Work in the Greater Learning. So on behalf of all of us, uh, we, just, we just want to give you a warm welcome to all our wonderful panelists and all of you who tune in from wherever you are. Uh, the great thing about this uh, having an online event is that you could be tuning in from the comfort of wherever you are, you know, in your home, uh, in your car, or you might you might be even be tuning in from a different time zone. So uh, we're really, really uh, welcome uh, and excited to have you all here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Albert, and I am the Employer Relations Manager uh, at Simon Fraser University Career and Volunteer Services, and I'm one of your co-hosts. Um, so as we begin, uh, I like to... Uh, just wanted to uh, acknowledge, uh, let me just, there we go. So uh, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the shared traditional territory of the Squamish, tsleil Musqueam, and the Coquitlam First Nations. And, uh, Another reminder is that this event will be recorded. So for many um, of our students and alum who couldn't tune in right at this moment, it will be archived and uploaded uh, at a location that we will make available to all of you. Um, and uh, just wanted to give you a very quick idea of, uh, of, the, uh, of our time together uh, at this online event. And we are, you know, we just wanted to do a very quick uh, welcome and introduction uh, and then we're going to move on to our of course the, uh, the the most important part is the panel discussion uh, but we will also have question and answer uh, throughout the uh, th uh, towards the end of the panel discussion uh, so as you can see I don't know if, uh, if, if some of you are new to uh, zoom webinar uh, you will find a Q&A box uh, in your um, in your uh, in your zoom software and you will be able to, uh, to raise questions. So, and I would like to encourage you uh, to put in questions throughout the panel discussion. Uh, and I'll be uh, working hard behind the scenes to curate and prioritize those questions. And then we're gonna relay that to our wonderful panel guests uh, towards the end of our Q&A. Uh, or not, well, to, towards the end of the discussion into the Q&A. That's what I meant. So uh, I don't know about you, but I had the privilege to uh, to get to know a little bit and have a short conversation uh, with our panelists uh, earlier. And you know, we're really in for a treat. You know, these are amazing, amazing professionals with lots of insights to uh, to to share. And we're so wonderful to have them. So on that note, I'm going to pass my time to my wonderful co-host uh, Miro Klemeski, director of SFU Work Integrated Learning, to welcome and introduce our panelists. So off to you, Miro. Hey, thank you, Albert. Um, I'm just looking at the participant numbers and we're five minutes into the half hour and we have 111 different participants who've joined us today. And, and that's a combination of students, uh, alumni, faculty, and, and, and others who are interested in, in learning more about what our, our panelists have today. So hello everyone and, and welcome to Sam and Fraser University's Employer Health Panel. And thank you to everyone for taking the time to be uh, present today. Um, as introduced by Albert, uh, my name is Muriel Klemetsky. I'm the Director of Work Integrated Learning at SFU. And in that role, I provide the, the oversight and the, and the management of the cooperative education and the internship opportunities at SFU. So today's panel to discussion is a very, very important topic. And I'm quite honored to be the moderator for this employer health panel. I think most folks are aware that the you know, job opportunities um, do continue to grow in healthcare and is one of BC's largest and fastest growing industries due to BC's increasing and aging population. Um, currently, the healthcare industry employs about 13% of BC's workforce, and this sector has fairly low unemployment rates and has been immune to the economic fluctuations due to the increasing need for healthcare services. At the same time, I think we all recognize that there are very, very many um, system-wide impacts that are really redefining how we work and live today. And, and those impacts, of course, include the COVID-19 and the, and the uh, pandemic that we're in, 
but there's also the resulting impact on the economy and the many businesses that are closing up or having to conduct their work remotely. And then I guess more recently, the, the, the civil unrest and activism that is taking place across the country. So all of these systems uh, have created somewhat I would call as uh, unprecedented, and it's ever-changing and very fast-moving. So when it comes to the pandemic, and we look at how this has impacted us, it's impacted all of us, and we are working and learning within that environment. So I'm quite eager to hear and also to learn from our panelists on, on how all of these moving impacts and all of these shifts are impacting the workplace and their hiring practices within the healthcare industries or organizations that they belong to. So let's begin with getting to know our panelists first. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves by outlining your career path. Like, how did you get to where you are today? What was your educational background? What types of roles did you take on? And what were the organizations that led you to where you are today? So let's begin um, to start off the panel discussions. Let's begin with Ashley Kwan. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Ashley Kwan. And to start out my career journey, I was just reflecting back as you were talking there to how long ago I was sitting in the exact same place as many of the people that are on the webinar today. So I myself am an SFU alumni times two. So about just about 11 years ago, I was sitting exactly where many of you are today, either as students or recent, uh, recent alumni. Um, I got my undergraduate degree from biomedical physiology, kinesiology, BPK at SFU. And I was, it was about uh, 2009, I should say, when I was just starting to wrap up my degree and wondering, you know, what was I going to do and where was I going to go? And I applied for my second co-op position and landed a job with, with Fraser Health. And at that time, I was thinking, well, it'll extend my degree. Do I want to do it? Do I not? I, you know, I just was really eager to get out into the world. And I remember going back and forth with the co-op advisors and saying, should I take it? I don't know. Well, all I could say is thank goodness I did, because here I am over, you know, 10, 11 years later, still with Fraser Health. So obviously, I took it, accepted it. And um, so I was in my co-op position for about eight months. Uh, in working with uh, falls uh, prevention in research. I worked as a research assistant. And then during that time, um, someone who was the research coordinator left the team. So I stepped into her position after my co-op. And then after that, someone who was in a permanent coordinator role for seniors falls and injury prevention within Fraser Health left. So I was able to move into a permanent role just about a year and a bit after I had started my, my co-op job. Um, and then over the 10 years, my position changed a little um, bit. I stayed with the same team doing mainly work in injury prevention and fall prevention, as well as a lot of different research in those different aspects. And, um, and finally, more towards the end, I decided to go back to SFU and BPK again to do my master's degree. And it was great because I was working on a project through Fraser Health but we're able to connect it to my master's. And so I've just finished that last year in 2019. And earlier this year moved roles within Fraser Health. So I switched to a different team and I'm currently in um, the research department at Fraser Health as research development specialist. So that's sort of a long rambly way, way to say that started with co-op and uh, entered Fraser Health and then have never left because it's a fantastic place to work and really enjoy the journey that has combined both SFU and co-op, um, co-op, as well as the uh, Fraser Health throughout the years. So that's a bit for me. Thank you, Ashley. Um, why don't we move on to Curtis then? Thanks, Muriel. Um, yeah, a little bit about myself. So I'm the CEO and president of Innovative Fitness, which is a personal training company, the largest personal training company across North America. And a little background of how I got here. It's, it's, I think pretty much a straight line. At the age of 16 years old, I got into sports and recreation. I was always a high level athlete. As uh, you know, during my time at SFU, I was on the national water polo team and I also worked full time. So at the age of 20, I, I managed a rec center that had, I believe 100, 110 lifeguards, uh, 20 fitness staff and, and, um, and 20 admin, uh, approximately 20 admin staff. It was called the Surrey Sport and Leisure Complex. I don't know how I, 
I went to school full time, um, held a full time job and was on the national water polo team, but I did it. And uh, the day, uh, the year before I graduated from kinesi from my a bachelor's of kinesiology at SFU, I actually decided to shift my career from the recreational uh, world to private personal training. And I started personal training people in, in West Vancouver. And uh, after I graduated, things kind of evolved and I've been in the industry ever since. So um, where we're at right now is we have 12, 12 locations, brick and mortar locations. We have a virtual offering, which is, you know, changed and shifted with the, the times of today. And uh, most, you know, most of our locations are in the Vancouver area, but we span from Victoria to Kelowna all the way to Toronto. Um, and have over 250 personal trainers that work with us and, and 12, once again, 12 brick and mortar locations. So, so I've been doing that for the last 18 years. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's a, it's a fairly straight line. Over the course of that time, I've, I've gotten involved as an advisor. Um, I've been on, on many boards and, and uh, been involved in the health sector in different ways. But um, my primary business is, is uh, Innovative Fitness, which is a personal training company. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, let's move on to Daryl Burnham. Thank you, Muriel. I'm kind of feeling old here with this panel. So I, <laughs> my career goes back to the 70s and maybe a little bit before many of the folks on, on the, the call is, uh, are, have been born. So I was a, a psych student at SFU in the early 70s and I started volunteering at a local crisis center in a very, very grassroots organization of the day. And when I got my uh, degree in, in 76, I uh, knocked on their door looking for a reference and they said, well, they have a job there for a, uh, what they call a community development person doing, uh, uh, helping trying to develop new services for the community. And, uh, and I, so I, I took that because uh, no one else was knocking on my door to hire me. And uh, in about six months later, uh, the uh, executive director of the organization re kind of basically retired, went back to Nova Scotia, and they appointed me uh, as executive director. And this is, a, I was 22, and uh, the organization was very large, very diverse, it's the uh, Coquitlam Share Society. And so I was there for 11 years. And about halfway through my time at Share, I realized you know, I need a little bit more knowledge and skill. And so in 83, I joined, went through the SFU executive MBA program. And, uh, and that was very helpful for me for several things. One is to validate the, the challenge in the nonprofit world vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the for-profit or the business community, that the challenges we have in our field are, are as uh, challenging and difficult and sometimes more difficult because we often have uh, multiple bottom lines and many different stakeholders to please. And so that was very useful, as well as some of the technical skills I got uh, through the, the MBA program. So it was very helpful. And I, and I got the MBA in 86, and I, I joined Coast Mental Health uh, at the, uh, the day in 1987. And I've been there ever since. So I've been there, uh, this is my 33, 33rd year in an organization dedicated to helping people with uh, uh, mental illness and uh, recover from mental illness. So. We've grown a lot, we've evolved a lot. It's been a challenging role, but extremely worthwhile. In part of, I'm, I work in the part of healthcare that I, I often see the after picture. There are other, some parts of healthcare see people at their worst, the most sickest and the most challenged. We, can, we help people move forward in their lives. And, uh, and so we're in the, the, the great position to see people move forward and, and recover and, uh, and um, go forward in their lives. So that's been very worthwhile. Well, thank you, Daryl. Um, and now for Mark Jones, please. Hi, uh, Muriel. How did you let me on this panel? This is like very directed <laughs> people. Uh, I'm the person that falls into stuff, right? So uh, currently my role, uh, Mark Jones, is uh, the Manager of Occupational Health and Safety for the Healthcare Employers Association of British Columbia. So we represent about 200 um, organizations. Uh, we are the bargaining agent for those organizations, and they represent about in the region of 160,000 employees. Uh, my background begins, uh, unfortunately, Daryl's way back as well, uh, that uh, I'm a post-Thatcher worker. Uh, my work life started in the UK. I did very badly in my A-levels, so uh, basically I uh, took a, a job in the labs, which was more like an apprenticeship. You, you became chief bottle washer, then the next year you were making agars, then the next year you were growing uh, bugs. Um, from that, I ended up in various research uh, projects, pretty much as a, as the, as a gopher to um, PhDs and uh, the researchers. And that evolved into basically biosafety. 
uh, and then I made the big mistake of going into COSH, which in the UK was Controlled Substances Hazards to Health. It is basically like uh, Canada's WIMIS. And putting this into healthcare and um, uh, healthcare and uh, academic institutions. Now, because we make entries into these chemical vaults, uh, we quickly evolved into a hazmat team because we were constantly calling the fire departments and the Ministry of Defense, right? If it was explo uh, sorry, if it was uh, flammable, the fire department. If it's explosive, we called the MOD. Those relationships evolved because we were connected to researchers. We then became actually a, a liaison group to those first responders. What sort of suits they need for the, uh, for the fires? What do they need to do? I returned to uh, Canada in uh, the 2000. I am Canadian. Uh, did various jobs and then ended up in 2001 back into healthcare, uh, where I actually handled uh, security contracts for the health authorities. Uh, 2003 was the outsourcing of certain uh, uh, certain sectors. From that, I ended up in uh, actually actually where I started, biosafety, uh, doing. Uh, Occupational health and safety for healthcare systems, and I've unfortunately I can't keep a job. I've worked for pretty much every lower mainland <laughs> health authority that exists. Uh, I was in a service partnership with Fraser Health. Actually, I wasn't actually <laughs> hired by you. Uh, and from that side, basically, like many of, uh, of yourselves, I got the reputation for resolving problems, uh, both occupational health and safety, and some that weren't. And from that, I evolved. I became the manager of Vancouver Coastal Health OHS, and then that led to my current position at HEABC. Okay, thank you, Mark. Well, as you can see, we have a very diverse range of backgrounds and experiences that our panelists have come from, and that their journey into their current career path has been quite varied for each and every one of them. Um, but I think one of the things that we all have in common to some degree right now is that we are finding ourselves working and or learning or studying at home. So the next question that I'd like to pose to the panelists are, what are some of the best practices or tips that help you to be effective when working remotely? Okay, so uh, just to mix it up a bit, uh, we'll start with you, Mark. I just talked. Okay. <laughs> uh, working from home actually works for me. Unfortunately, I'm a, a chatty Cathy, so I'm far less distracted at home. So it, it is, uh, it is, it's working quite well for me. Uh, some of the tools and things that we've had to evolve for the whole uh, HA, our 150 employees at HABC. Uh, I've been on the same learning curve, uh, Zoom uh, and other technologies. Okay, um, Ashley? Yes. Um, tips or best practices? For sure. So I, I think for me, it, it wasn't entirely new because over my role, I worked for a mobile clinic, which moved all over the place. So I was used to having my laptop and connecting to Wi-Fi and working here and there and everywhere. The change that was different for me was consistently working from home and nonstop, you're in the same place. So the tip and, and the challenge that I've had to overcome is making sure this one place that I'm going to be is set up well. And um, I've had to um, make some changes and adaptations over the time I've been working from home. And I'll say, um, invest in your space, whatever that's gonna be, workspace. I have put a little bit of money in, for example, getting you know, a proper keyboard tray and um, you know, proper supports and whatnot. But at the same time, I have also had some cheap or no cost solution where I'm using you know, a cushion for an anti-fatigue mat. You know, and I'm using an old Christmas wrapping box to prop up my screen to the right height. So I think the thing is it's getting creative, but also investing in. And after I set it all up one day, I was excited the next morning to come and see my beautiful setup. So I think that's the thing is make it somewhere that you're going to want to come to and you can use paid or, you know, some creative solutions to make it that way. So it's great to hear how you've made that work for you. So good on you. Uh, let's move on to uh, Curtis. Yeah, for sure. I mean, besides the obvious for me, which I have a four and a six year old at home, so that doesn't make it uh, any easier. So I got to find a lock for the, the office door. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, studies have already shown that productivity is actually going up as people are actually working remotely, but wellness is going down. So if I can give any um, piece of advice or tips, it, besides what Ashley and Mark have already shared is creating boundaries and structure. You know, when we, when we commute to work, we automatically have boundaries, which is usually the commute. Mm -hmm. um, it's leaving the office, it's, it's getting in our cars and driving home. 
when we're at home, we can get tied up with working all the time. And, and we tend not to get away from our desk and go outside and, you know, take the breaks that we need, let alone getting the fitness or nutrition that we need and, and, um, and having the dialogue, like the personal connections, the emotional connections with people around us. So um, if anything, I would say create structure and create boundaries so that you know that you can uh, balance out what you need in your life whether that's emotional connections and or physical health, as an example. That's great advice, Curtis. Thank you for that. Uh, and from Daryl? Well, I, I must admit, I found the adjustment more difficult because I actually like to uh, kind of get the, the, the talk to the staff, talking to the clients. I think there's a real important leadership uh, uh, component with that. However, the, the nice thing with Zoom is that we've actually had staff town halls with over 150 people on the line. And so we've actually been able to reach more people better than we ever could face to face. So that's been a, a pleasant surprise. So that's been a beneficial issue. Uh, I, and I've also go, go into the office at least a couple of times. The week just to go and, and office is virtually empty. Uh, so uh, that, that's been useful as well. And I, and I agree with the other panelists uh, strategies for your uh, for uh, taking breaks and taking walks and also having your, your space set up. Thank you for that, Daryl. I know um, a piece of advice that I had heard at a previous webinar was how folks are either attempting to take a walk prior to going to walk or right after work. Make sure that they get out of the house and go do something else out of your so-called office, whatever that might look like right now. So all, all great advice to, that we've heard from the panelists. So let's move on to the next question then. Um, I want to explore a little bit more on trends and innovations that are very uh, sector specific to the healthcare area. So I'm asking you to look back you know, in the past or, or thinking of today and or imagining what the future might look like. And you don't have to address all of them, but th th in terms of the questions, how has the healthcare industry changed over the past few years? Or if you'd like to speak to current trends in your industry, you know, within a COVID environment, you know, what are the current trends? And then looking more to the, into the future or innovations or technologies, what might we anticipate or how is the industry evolving? So let's begin with Daryl. Great, I got to go first. Um, <laughs> one thing you, didn't, you haven't mentioned, and I think it's landed and, and really been quite devastating to healthcare is the opioid crisis. In 2016, fentanyl landed in the lower mainland, in Canada and North America. And just uh, in May, 170 people died from, uh, from uh, drug poisonings. That's more than the pandemic in the total time we've had the pandemic. Uh, and so it is a very serious issue and certainly the substances and the ch behavioral challenges because also things like crystal meth and, and, and other uh, uh, substances and there's cocktails of drugs that actually create behavioral challenges with people. So uh, we're just not dealing as a mental health organization with someone's schizophrenia often. We're also dealing, dealing with someone's uh, substance use issue, whatever that may be to them and the very real risks that they could overdose and either die or need to be resuscitated. And, uh, and then also uh, more and more people, if they've been living rough for a period of time, have significant primary health issues. And so we are, we're not just a mental health organization, we're, we're an addiction treatment organization and, and also a, a primary care organization. So that's been a profound change in, in uh, the field that I've seen just in the last four years. Okay, thank you, Daryl. So on to Curtis, um, any trends that you'd like to speak to that are current or innovations, technologies, or things that you've really noticed over the past few years that have significantly changed? I think thanks to technology and, and things such as wearable tech, well, wearable technology as an example, has shifted and changed the, the fitness and, and the personal training industry. Uh, you know, now we have access to more information, more data than we ever did. And I think thanks to obviously the internet and, and accessible to, you know, accessibility to information, the consumer is looking for more of a personalized treatment plan or, or approach. You know, gone are the days where we look at our nutrition, such as the Canada Food Guide, all the way to, you know, fitness is a generic thing. And so over the last five years, thanks to data and accessibility of that data, um, are the shifts and changes we've seen in the fitness and, and personal training industry is that people are looking more for personalized wellness and personalized healthcare, and that's customizable and we have access to that information now and so they're looking for more guidance around that and i think also at the end of the day if you look at the general consumer most people get what they want when they want it to their needs specifically that has their names or 
whatever branded they're creating their their uh, you know whatever the consumer good might be. And so I think from a healthcare perspective, um, you know, people are looking for that personalized approach a little bit more. So Ashley, um, your comments regarding this topic. For sure. So I would just continue a little bit on that same thread is one of the things that I've noticed, and this is sort of longer term, but over, over the last 10 years or so, working it, primarily um, doing clinical work for proactive or, or preventative um, sort of uh, health care. What I've noticed is that more so nowadays, people are coming with an idea of um, some information that they've already looked at. So people are investing a little bit more in figuring out things before they come to their healthcare provider. And what I mean by that is that um, people are doing some self-education, which is fantastic because they're coming with the knowledge and not just, um, you know, coming blindly and asking for um, any information. And particularly in the research fields, I've noticed that um, clinicians and healthcare professionals are asking for that patient, family, client perspective of, okay, well, we know what we know but what do the patients, clients, mm -hmm. and people in the community know and what do they want? So I think those two things sort of go together is that people are feeling that they want to seek information about themselves mm -hmm. and they also want to be involved in the work, the research, the healthcare that um, you know, we are providing for them and with them. So I think that's something that we'll really see emerging even more is that patient-oriented or client-oriented or person-centered approach that is uh, being talked about more and more, and thankfully, because it's it's moving in the right direction from, from my perspective. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Mark? There's a lot going on, all right? I think that uh, for the last five years, what, what I've noticed, particularly on the corporate side, is the uh, lean and agile have been used in the health authorities for, for quite a while, right? They've been used, but I don't think they've been fully understood. And we've seen that transition where, particularly for like patient flow and that sort of stuff, where the leading the process have really helped us out. Uh, still a, a work in progress from the, uh, the corporate side and stuff. We'll also see uh, what I've seen is the transition from um, the health authorities and, and health in, in general as basically data collectors to actually using their data. They, they have a massive amount of data. And this is really now starting to guide our operations. Uh, for my personal work, the, the biggest top, uh, topic that I've currently got is um, the acknowledgement of psychological health and safety in the workforce. Right? Work safe BC, uh, basically now it's a presumptive clause that if you have a, a, a record of trauma within the health uh, sector, uh, your claim will be accepted. But actually that's uh, bringing it out of the dark. That's, you mean, our um, BC ambulance dispatchers, our doctors, our nurses, they've got a tough job and they see some stuff that is, is tough and that accumulative trauma um, is, is got to be addressed in order to prevent burnout and keep them in the workplace. So, Given what I've, I've heard you comment in terms of some of the emerging um, areas within the healthcare industry, th the next question I wanted to focus more specifically is on job opportunities within a COVID context in terms of like which roles, which types of positions are critical or in demand in healthcare right now, or where do you see the opportunities within your sector or organization right now? And let's go back to you, Mark. Well, unfortunately, we will never get away from the fact we need frontline workers. We need nurses, doctors, all of that. I think what people don't understand is the infrastructure that's sitting behind. We want uh, nurses to do nursing tasks. We do not want them to do uh, financing, budgeting, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so there's a massive workforce of people like myself, right, that are sitting in the background who are doing the data crunching. So all of the sort of lean, agile, uh, business analysts, data analysts, these are our growing, uh, uh, growing uh, uh, workers within our sector. Uh, knowing again that we are a public sector, so it, it undulates, right? So basically, eventually the bill for COVID will come due. Uh, so you, you, you may not see that increase immediately, right, in, in those sort of uh, corporate job sites. You might see a decrease initially as we, as we pay for the, the costs and things. But you mean the, the increase that we anticipate for telehealth and all that, and all of that sort of IT infrastructure that's needed in the background, you'll definitely see increases there. Also, the byproduct of COVID as well is that the health authorities are moving quicker on, on new technologies, uh, something that uh, I think even for SFU, you said uh, Zoom was implemented quite quickly. It was the same for us, right? Three days, we had a Zoom contract in place, something that would normally take, what, 10 to 20 years. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> um, Ashley, do you want to continue that conversation in terms of what are some of the, the critical or in-demand healthcare areas right now where you see opportunities? For sure. So I would echo technology-based positions for sure and data-based positions. Absolutely same, seeing the same thing within, uh, within Fraser Health. One other thing I've noticed is because a lot of the emergency operations require someone that is there to guide people through who are doing a lot of their oftentimes their clinical roles or their management roles as well, there is a demand for individuals with project management skills or facilitation skills where they're the ones behind the scenes um, bringing in all the players that need to be there to support the emergency operations. So there have been those individuals that exist within the health authority have been pulled to COVID related projects with their strong project management skills. And then a second large area that I would say, and that's you know currently the world that I'm um, involved in is research. So of course, with something like COVID, um, you know, relatively unknown, obviously when it started and we're knowing more, but uh, research-based positions, and that's where a lot of funding has gone from yeah, federally um, into research and trying to figure out all of the different aspects of what's going on. So I'd say for sure, research-based um, skills uh, would be another area. Okay, thank you, Alan, or Ashley. Uh, let's move on to Curtis, please. You know, not much different in the health and, and fitness sector. Um, without a doubt, we got disrupted significantly over the last, uh, you know, three months, obviously with the closing of gyms and, and fitness facilities, whether it's a boutique studio or personal training. Um, so I think, you know, obviously it forced uh, not only innovation, but, you know, just evolution of, of the fitness industry that was ready to be disrupted. And, and that, you know, that opened up the opportunity for technology, you know, and so technology and research, I think is going to be a huge opportunity for a lot of people that want to um, evolve the technology from a fitness and healthcare perspective. Uh, and then, you know, with that, I mean, we could, I think we're going to be talking about it later, but the innovation that occurred from a, from personal training and fitness related um, services now have shifted from obviously in person to, you know, at home or, or, you know, remote. And so, you know, obviously we have to think about where the positions and opportunities lie and they aren't the same as what they were before. And to be honest, I don't think, I think it's gonna be shifted for, um, you know, indefinitely going forward. I think we're still gonna have gyms, we're still gonna have fitness facilities, but I think there's gonna be a larger demand, <clears throat> larger demand and interest uh, for, you know, any kind of remote coaching or, or services done remotely, so. Okay. And Daryl. We have, we have roles in direct care. We have 24 seven operations, 50 sites across the lower mainland. So we need people, especially anyone who wants to work nights, we could pretty well get them a job, particularly if they have a mental health or a degree. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily the most attractive shift, but it's something we need. Yeah. But even in, in technical positions, right now we're have posting for IT manager, posting for a property manager to work, uh, uh, keeping our property safe. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities and uh, and we're always researching uh, searching for the right people to work in this field. There has been a growth, particularly in uh, some of the housing areas in the last uh, five years in, in the lower mainland. And so I know all the nonprofits have been looking for capable people to work with uh, fairly complex individuals. So those are some of the types of opportunities and the, and the types of positions that are in demand right now. Um, are you able to comment on the type of hiring or recruiting trends that you are seeing in your organization right now? Like, what are your expectations for the fall and or for, say, early 2021? Like, we have a lot of SFU students that are still seeking summer opportunities and they're searching for, say, a co-op work term, be it for the fall or for the spring. Uh, and I know within our own SFU co-op program, um, our opportunities for this past summer, they're down by about 30% as compared to say the previous uh, summer. Um, and we've seen a lot of changes in even what those positions look like within the co-op um, work environment. Students of course are working remotely. Uh, we may have to be reducing hours or redu reducing work weeks. So I'm more interested in learning specifically about how your industry or organization is adapting to recruitment and the hiring of uh, individuals into your organization. So like, what are your expectations for the fall and, and for say early spring 2021? Um, Mark, do you want to start? Yeah, I think like many people, we, we anticipate a slowdown. 
right? I mean, uh, I think as Ashley commented, we'll see more uh, short-term contracts for say project managers and the like, uh, rather than you're coming in as a casual to our, our labor pool or simply as a, as a temporary employee. Uh, so that's what I foresee. Okay. Um, uh, Daryl, uh, within Coast Mental Health or? Yeah, well, actually, I, I, would, I think there's going to be lots of opportunities. One thing we're doing, actually, I think of next week, it goes live, as we're, we have 50 opportunities through the, the new federal funded Canadian Canada Uni College uh, Volunteer Program. So we have 50 opportunities across our organization, some technical, some research, some uh, direct service roles. And we're looking for, for students who, uh, who want, uh, want to spend a couple of months. Uh, they get paid through the federal government through a, a, some kind of grant program. I'm not quite sure the technolo technology of it. But to just to, and it's a good opportunity for them to explore, see if they like the field. If they li like it, they'll love it. And if they don't, they don't. It's one of those things, there's not a lot in between. And, uh, and it's a really nice way to, to do that. We need work, uh, uh, workers. We, we always have a challenge filling our shifts uh, throughout the organization. We are unionized. That means people do start uh, generally in casual and then move forward unless they're into uh, moving into a, a leadership position as an excluded staff. And then we, we go to the marketplace for that. But uh, uh, there are opportunities out there. Okay. And, and Curtis, any recruitment trends that you're implementing within Innovative Fitness? Well, prior to COVID, you know, I looked at it, it was an employee's market. It was really difficult to find good staff. It was very competitive. Um, you know, it was, it was very challenging. We had a lot of vacancies that we couldn't fill. And now, you know, post, well, not necessarily post COVID, but now in the position that we're in right now, you know, we have a lot of competition that obviously, you know, have not survived uh, COVID. There's less jobs available. Um, there's more people looking. So I, I think the shift has gone from an employee's market to an employer's market. And so I think it's going to be more competitive. I mean, from an employer perspective, we're lucky because now we get to, you know, hand select the pick of the litter. So I think people are going to have to be more on top of their game and, and uh, they have to show up um, a lot stronger than, than they did in the past. You know, we were desperately looking for high quality candidates and A players. And now, you know, there's less less opportunity out there. And, and, uh, and so, you know, from an employer perspective, we're excited by that. We've already hired some people, um, you know, during the, the, you know, the COVID, uh, the last three months during COVID. And, and uh, we're looking to up level our leadership team, up level our training staff and, and uh, looking for more A players. So, you know, that's something that we're seeing. I think, you know, just the trend in the industry, how it got disrupted, looking for people. I think there's going to be more opportunity from a global standpoint, right? Like, you know, with the remote coaching and, and the digital platforms that exist, I think we can hire people outside of our geographical regions that we were confined to before. And, um, and so that's going to provide opportunity as well for us. Okay. That's, that's great to hear. Um, and Ashley, uh, your comments on this topic in terms of recruitment and hiring trends. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that fairly immediately after everything started and the, um, the majority of the sort of behind the scenes is to steal a word from Mark, um, individuals within the, the health authority, so the corporate professionals um, were primarily and continue to be for the most part working remotely. I think there was a lot of trying to figure out how the staff were going to be doing that. Um, you know, and I do know that anecdotally there were co-ops that were either postponed or moved back or whatnot so I mean over my time that I've been with Fraser Health I've seen the number of co-op positions offered within Fraser Health um, increase substantially I think back way back when I was one of you know a few a handful that were at Fraser Health and now there are a lot more so I think it will take some time to figure out what that might look like um, especially if people are continuing to work remotely um, but the thing about Fraser Health and healthcare in general is that um, it's not going anywhere and it's still operating 24 7 and will continue to be so those positions might change or they might look different, particularly in some of the work where um, people aren't quite sure how they're gonna go back. So uh, if it's not, um, for example, acute care that has been consistent consistently running, if it's a program that might've scaled back during, co um, during the COVID, then obviously there will be some understanding what it'll look like going forward, but for sure, healthcare, Fraser Health isn't going anywhere. I'd encourage you to check out the website and continue to monitor it, even if you're not looking for a job, but just to see what is posted and what, um, what the requirements are for certain postings. It's a good idea to keep an eye on that, um, as well as volunteer positions too. So there are definitely opportunities.
Okay. So thank you, Ashley. So, I mean, I have more questions, but I, I just want to check in with Albert as I would presume that there may be some questions from some of our participants. And so Albert, I'll just uh, pass it over to you if you'd like to share some of those questions that have come through. Yeah, absolutely. Just want to say thank you for all the attendees out there. Uh, our Q&A box is on fire and uh, I've been, <laughs> you know, I've been uh, trying to uh, curate some of these questions and group them together. Uh, so I have one that I've been asked sort of differently by a few attendees is that, you know, to for all the panelists. So what advice uh, would you give to students who are not necessarily have a health or science related background? Uh, you know, how do they get into the healthcare sector, in your opinion, if they, you know, if they don't have that? So shall we start with Ashley? Any suggestions on that topic? Sure. So as that question was asked, I was thinking of students, co-op students that we've hired on to the, our team previously that um, were, that was exactly the case. They didn't know healthcare. They had no idea. And for example, the, you know, in some situations I'm thinking where um, we were seeking more someone with uh, data or um, specific um, computer science based um, uh, uh, experience. So the thing is within healthcare, there are a lot of positions that may not um, directly come from the health science or um, kinesiology or whatever your program may be world. So really in that it's um, selling yourself and showing individuals why you have the skills that can apply to healthcare. And in this, you know, the cases that I'm thinking of in my, um, in my thought there as well, the healthcare and that experience, they were able to learn, but they came to us with those skills that the health authority needed. Um, so really learn how to sell your skills and um, if you can think of an opportunity of how it could apply within health, the health world, it's possible for sure. Okay, so articulating what you know and have experienced or your knowledge and, and applying it to the, the opportunity that you're looking for. Exactly. Um, uh, Mark, um, do you have some other suggestions? I think uh, very similar to what Ashley said uh, previously about volunteers, right? Basically, it's, it's getting into the system and building those relationships. So you may not get your dream job initially, but once you're in there and people understand that you've got a skill set, it's the word of mouth within the system does travel really quite quickly. Actually, I know a person. They're very, very good at data, right? So I'm just going to pass that name on. Uh, that's invaluable within the healthcare sector uh, to me. Okay. And, and Daryl? I would agree. I think uh, if someone could get in the door through volunteering or or an internship, uh, we do a lot of internships from different different faculties across in different universities and colleges. Those are really useful ways to get real life experience, uh, get known within the organization, and also test whether or not this is something you like. And uh, if you and you can develop those skills, so I, I think it is really useful uh, to focus where your, your knowledge later on. But to get into the ground floor, uh, uh, I think you can start as a volunteer, casual worker and then uh, go from there. And Curtis, how do they get involved in your business? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with the, with the panelists and their contributions to this question. And, and one of the other things I was gonna add is that, you know, in terms of uh, different experience or education when coming into the healthcare sector, like I know in health and fitness, we're a growing organization. We, you know, you might not be looking for a role that, that might be a personal trainer or a fitness professional, but we're definitely looking for people that have uh, education skills and strengths in marketing or finance or other areas. So that's the nice, you know, don't rule that out. If you're interested in the healthcare sector and you don't have formal education that in, in healthcare, you know, there's great companies and organizations that are looking for skills, education, and experience in different fields, you know, and, and, and that's when you can actually really combine uh, what you're good at with what you're passionate about. And I always say that, you know, look at, at organizations, uh, for, you know, hopefully you're passionate about the industry. Uh, hopefully, you know, there's aligned purpose or aligned values, and hopefully you can meet the expectations of your pay. But, it, you know, just because you might have different education doesn't mean that all, most organizations don't need those skills. And I think I would add with every experience and exposure that you have with any type of organization, it, it just might open up another door that you didn't even know about. So to, you know, give some things a chance, right? So Albert, is there another question from participants that we can share? 
Absolutely. Yeah. In some ways, you know, this is sort of like a follow up question to, you know, to what we've just asked about, you know, I think a few attendees sort of ask, well, you know, if I am interested in the healthcare sector, you know, what types of perhaps experience, skills or strength, you know, that I really want to highlight that would make me stand out. So, uh, you know, regardless of what education background they're in, you know, uh, you know, so, so is there anything you guys want to highlight in terms of uh, skills background that, you know, that job, you know, job seekers could focus on to, uh, to have a better chance to landing those positions. Uh, Curtis, do you want to start us off in terms of, you know, what kind of uh, skill sets you would recommend job seekers develop? Yeah, for sure. I think what we see in our, in our organization and consistently with the people that apply, you know, we're not, we're not uh, necessarily interested in, in the resume that's filled with a, you know, a, a long length of experience in the industry. We're actually more looking for some of their life skills. So communication, goal setting, time management, skills that, that they might have learned through their, their uh, educational um, tenure, whether it's at SFU or any other university. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are coming out of, of university without some of those skills developed. And, and I think it's very imperative. I mean, you know, if you want to set the stage, uh, let alone grow within an organiz organization, if you have skills such as time management, goal setting, um, communication, and other marketable skills, I think it's going to go a long way. Uh, over to you, Daryl. Uh, passion, passion for the work, uh, resilience, the ability to deal with issues of strains and stresses, so personal resilience, and great communication skills, the ability to express yourself, to listen well, to work with uh, within a team. Uh, all those are kind of foundational pieces. Okay. And Ashley and then Mark. For sure. So I, a lot of it, I would say, comes back to getting in and, and volunteering and trying things out. Um, oftentimes when we're reviewing resumes or looking at applications, if we see that someone has been within Fraser Health in any kind of volunteer role, that's an, oh, wow, that's interesting, even if it's not in the field or related at all. So that is always spikes the interest, regardless of, of what it is. And on top of that, I would also say uh, connection skills. And what I mean by that is connecting with individuals regardless of where you are or um, you know, whether that be through school or through your um, work that you're doing, regardless of whether it's your long-term career, connect with individuals because those are the skills that are gonna get you far when you do get into your career. And Mark? Yeah, very similar to what people have already said, like part of our interview process is you have to do a 20 minute presentation straight off the bat on any topic you like. It could be work related, but if you don't have any work experience, tell us something about your life because we want to know about that communication skill and your people skills straight off the bat. The rest, we can teach you a lot. Okay. Albert, uh, another question, please. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so now we wanted to sort of zoom out a little back to, you know, sort of looking at the whole sector. So one question that uh, one of our attendees was asking is, uh, are there any sort of privacy or security related uh, sort of concerns or issues that, you know, that you guys foresee uh, that will, you know, that will affect, you know, sort of the healthcare sector as, you know, as technology is become more enabled, you know, in terms of sort of transforming the industry? What are the pros and cons that you guys see? In, in that transformation, having more technology involved. Why don't we go in reverse this time? Mark and then Ashley. Uh, well, many people in my EMBV, EMBA program actually mock me because we are behind, right? <laughs> we are, healthcare is, we can't just innovate, right? The cloud is still most probably two years away from us, right? Because if you communicate directly with the Ministry of Health, if you communicate directly with healthcare, there are certain uh, parameters you can't you can't change. The servers have to be in Canada. There's ways around that, but we are not quick to adopt that. So I think that they, you mean, those are the privacy issues that we need to address, that actually we get confidence in the newer technologies, know where they're housed, and that we have experts to sort of in the background to ensure that uh, the security of people's information is tight. So great. So I would carry on from that and, and echo what Mark said. There are definitely privacy concerns and there are entire departments within the health authority looking at that and constantly working through this and especially now working through it very quickly and in a completely different world. The other thing that's somewhat connected to privacy, but for me that has come out a lot with the technology and the increased use of this is access. And so one of the pieces that we see is that we're moving a lot to remote and using video-based and technology-based um, 
ways of communicating and delivering healthcare, but we're also assuming that the individuals we're delivering healthcare to have access to technology, which is, is not the case. And so that in terms of getting individuals the ability to be able to access and then also additionally protecting their privacy on top of it is definitely something that the health authority is trying to work through in these times um, when we are switching to predominantly a lot more remote based healthcare. Um, Daryl and then Curtis. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think uh, uh, the privacy issue, particularly in the mental health field, it's really important to keep well, not only the, the client data uh, private, but also stay, staff information and with cyber, uh, cyber hacks and, and the, uh, the, all the air, uh, risks there, it, it's really quite concerning. So it's very hard in my field, at least, to raise money to uh, build your technical infrastructure. So it's certainly one of the challenges we have. It's much easier to raise money to, to actually provide a caregiver than the back end uh, support for people to provide that care. So we're, we're lagging behind what we would like to be in, in the uh, field, even though I think we've got a pretty good system, but it's certainly not there. And, and actually the comment about access to technology, we want to do more virtual care because even with the COVID world, some of our occupancies are going to be 20 to 30% of the normal occupancy for clients. And so that means people are excluded, not ac accessing service. And so if we can f figure out a way to reach them through, uh, through either Zoom or some other kind of virtual uh, support, then that would actually break down and may actually extend their cap capacity. But one of the big, big, big issues is people's access to secure technology. And Curtis? I really, truly don't have any more, uh, more insights than what the panelists shared. So I'm gonna, why don't we move on to the next question? Okay. Um, Albert, is there one more question? Uh, yes. Um, you know, I wonder, you know, I think um, of all the, of all the wonderful panelists we have, what would be that one advice that you would have for our, you know, whether current students or recent grads or, you know, or some of our folks who are in career transitions that you would like to offer, uh, you know, based on sort of everything that we've said so far, any one advice for us? Now I'm going to toss it out there. Who'd like to start with that one? I think start. Okay. You no, know, actually uh, try things. And either it's a volunteer or, or other things. Look at an organization. You like their model, like their, their vision, and, and maybe the principles. Is it aligned with you as a person? Is the kind of work something that, that, that really turns you on is an, an interesting area? And then reach out. I had a person, uh, this is a few years back, who uh, wanted to work for my organization and I didn't have a role for him. He came in there, I'll work for a dollar, but you need to give me an office and this is what I'm gonna do. And he did and within a few months he was a manager. You know, and so uh, start, uh, but do it in a rational way. That find things that you, that you think you'd really be interested in. Anyone else? Ashley, Mark, Curtis? I can jump in. Tamara, what, uh, oh, sorry Curtis. I'd love to jump in on, on uh, talk, you know, after Daryl's comments, because I couldn't agree more with the Dar what Daryl said. And, and, you know, to be honest, yeah, um, on top of that is be all in, like be all in. So if you, can, if you can find something that an organization or an environment that matches your principles, your values, you know, there's strong alignment, um, you know, then make the commitment to be all in. It's not a matter of making the commitment to be there for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But if you don't, jump in with both feet, you're never going to truly see and experience what you're going to get out of it. And so I find sometimes when, you know, people have one foot in, one foot out, from the moment they walked in the door, it's never going to work. You're never going to, just like a relationship, you can't have a part-time relationship. You're probably never going to get married and it's never going to work out well. So, you know, at the end of the day, I would say, make the commitment, be all in. That's when you're going to explore the most opportunity at that space that spot that organization and then you can determine if you have to move on or shift careers or change something else but you truly won't get and gain insight if it's the right fit for you if you're not all in to begin with sorry very very similar to what uh, the panelists have said right the the ability to pivot once you're in the health sector is enormous right once you're in and you're known Right. You, you, I started out uh, doing fall rest for uh, a new build. I've done behavioral facility design. I've done Ebola, right? These are all the spectrum of healthcare. There is nothing we don't touch. 
so getting in the door, being passionate is fantastic. All in, it's great stuff. Great, and echo all that, and I'd add to that, be genuinely interested in people, and, and people is really, really the part that I wanna focus on, because I can tell you we've had a lot of staff over the years who've come, they've all had really great skills, that's why they were hired, but the people that everyone on the team remembers and invites back and gives reference for are the people that were genuinely interested in the team and building the team. So those people that, you know, not in COVID times necessarily, but brought goodies or asked about people's families or remembered certain things, those are the people that continue to get hired back and are remembered even years later. Regardless of skill set, yes, there were some maybe that were even more skilled, but the ones that are remembered are the people that really connected deeply and genuinely cared about building those relationships. I'm going to add one, one more thing to that. Like if, if, if you don't, if you fear of getting left behind, don't let it happen. Seek out growth opportunities, research, develop. The learning, learning does not stop on the first day on the job. It does not stop the day you finish school. Um, it actually is the start <laughs> line. And so if you know, if you want to be a lifelong learner, or I encourage everybody to be a life, lo lifelong learner, it does not be, have to be in the confines of SFU or any other university or, or graduate program. Um, it's got to continue afterwards or else you will be left behind. So um, with, with those last few comments, I'd really, really like to thank all of the panelists for taking the time this afternoon to share that great advice and for sharing your personal and your professional experiences and, and the, the knowledge that you have in, in the healthcare industry. Uh, your insights and expertise on the healthcare are, are top notch and we really appreciate you sharing that with our, our staff, our students, our alumni, faculty and, and other guests. So Ashley, Curtis, Daryl, Mark, again, a really great thank you to you for being here today and for, for being a part of our SFU employer health panel. Um, in addition to the panelists here, I'd also like to acknowledge um, and recognize all of the staff um, and the other SFU units who helped to organize this panel. Again, those being the SFU Career and Volunteer Services, where Albert is from, the Work Integrated Learning Program, the Alumni Relations, and the Beatty School of Business. And in particular, Albert, thank you. Um, you know, your work behind the scenes has been tremendous, and thank you for partnering with me this afternoon. So again, thank you, everyone, um, and goodbye. But before I go, keep remembering, keep social distancing, wash those hands, stay safe. And with that, I'm gonna give it back to Albert for a final last check. Yeah, thank you, Muriel. Uh, you know, again, totally echoing all your thank yous to our wonderful panelists. But, and I also wanna say thank you to all of you who've tuned in today and all these wonderful questions. I wish we can uh, stay for another three hours to, you know, to cover <laughs> them all. Uh, you know, unfortunately we don't have the time, but I will be uh, collecting some of the individual questions and you know, kind of sharing that with our panelists. Uh, and on the chat box, uh, they've also kindly uh, shared their LinkedIn profile as well as uh, contact information. So, uh, so uh, before, you, before you log out, feel free to copy that so that you have access to that. Um, at the same time, you know, we really value everyone's feedback uh, for this uh, type of online event. So uh, our wonderful team will be sending you uh, all a survey, a really quick, uh, you know, two, three minute survey uh, to your email address. So we would love to get some feedback uh, so that we can do this better in the future. Uh, and speaking for the future, uh, this is uh, sort of the second uh, you know, second event of a series of employers panel that we've done this summer. Uh, the first one we've done that, uh, we've done it at the finance and insurance se sector, and we have recorded that and we'll have it archived uh, as well as this particular one. Once we get things organized, we'll have it online again. So to all your friends and people who uh, missed this, they can still check this out online. And in the near future, uh, we're also planning for one more uh, employer panel uh, before the end of the summer, very likely in July. The date is still uh, in discussion, but it will be focused on entrepreneurship. So if you're interested, do stay tuned to all our promos and, uh, and, and, and marketing, uh, and hopefully you will uh, join us again next time. Uh, and as a wrap up, you know, we would like to share with you uh, one last video. Uh, called the SFU on the move, sort of just sort of recapping as a university, as an engaged university, how we are connecting with our community and beyond the uh, and you know and beyond 
uh, the campus. So uh, so feel free to log out as you go. It's, it's just a really quick two, three minute uh, video. Uh, and uh, we wanted to uh, want to thank you again and, and wish all of you a very good day. Uh, and on behalf of our teams, uh, thank you. Uh, so we're going to end with this video and have a very good evening.